Good afternoon. This is Suresh Prabhu, Member of Parliament and former Cabinet Minister, Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal, Session Moderator, Past President IMA, and Chairman Hero Enterprise, Mr. R. Mukundan, Managing Director, Tata Chemicals Limited, Mr. Harry Broadman, Partner and Managing Director, Chair Emerging Markets Practice, Berkeley Research Group, LLC, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to have you with us in this very special IMA session of Horasis USA Meet and a warm welcome to everyone joining the session. IMA is the apex organization of India's management fraternity and it has been around for 66 years. It is a not-for-profit, non-lobbying body with 38,000 members and it focuses on spreading the management ethos in the country. IMA's Foundation Day has been declared the National Management Day in India. IMA currently holds the presidency of the Association of Asian Management Organizations, where a dozen of the most advanced economies of Asia are members. IMA's mandate is to provide thought leadership in management and to build management capacity in the country. IMA is also a preferred platform for India's top business leaders, policymakers, and experts for non-partisan dialogue on issues of national importance. IMA engages with some of the world's top think tanks and universities to facilitate cross-border dialogue on management and leadership issues. IMA has been conducting a management development program at the Silicon Valley for many years now, and IMA also organizes CEOs' delegations to the U.S. and a, and a U.S.-India conference, which it holds jointly with UC Berkeley. Visits to key innovative companies in the U.S. are also organized for top-level Indian CEOs. IMA has been a partner of Horasis for more than a decade, and this session is part of our effort to increase India's integration into the global economy. Mr. Prabhu, it is a privilege to have you. You're a veteran parliamentarian and former union minister who has overseen many of the transformative reforms that are driving India's economy today. You've also been India's Sherpa to G20, an important multilateral forum, and you have a, you have a signif significant voice in the government of India's policy considerations on global affairs. Many thanks for joining us today and a very warm welcome to you. Mr. Munjal, always such a pleasure to have you with us on the IMA platform. Thank you for agreeing to moderate this key session today. You are a prominent leader of corporate India and you run a conglomerate with strong presence both across the physical and digital economies. You are passionate about international collaboration and you are a strong votary of an open and globally engaged India. A warm welcome to you. Mr. Mukundan, it is a pleasure to have you with us. You are associated with India's most global conglomerate and the company under your charge has substantial international linkages. You have your finger on the pulse of the global trade and investment flows, and you're also a keen observer of international relations and geopolitics. Many thanks for joining us today. Harry, it is such a pleasure to have you with us again, and many thanks for agreeing to do this session. A versatile person, you have been in academics, consulting, administration, and policy think tanks. You're a respected expert on cross-border trade and investment and regulation matters. We look forward to hearing your take on the potential for growing India-US partnership on bilateral and multilateral issues. Thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, India-US partnership has become central to the global order as the world goes through the spasms of recovering from the pandemic and rebuilding for economic and security stability. India and the US helped each other deal during the spikes in COVID and prioritize each other in supply of relevant equipment and medicines. The leaders of the governments of the two countries met last September and reaffirmed the commitment to strengthen mutual cooperation across a whole host of areas, especially strategic affairs, trade and investment, climate change, and supporting democracies. It is no longer a case of stating the obvious that India and the US are natural partners because of being large democracies. The post-virus world faces the risk of becoming polarized as it encounters divisions on governance issue, values and technology standards. More than ever before, the India-US partnership is central to achieving an open and rule-based global order. The world must not forget the lessons of the 20th century and balance col collaboration with competition between nations. Given India's centrality in Asia, it is vital that the US and India unify their agenda and deepen their engagement. With these opening remarks, it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Munjal to conduct the session. Over to you, Mr. Munjal. 
Thank you, Rekha. And I'd like to compliment Horasis for organizing this IMA specific session on US, India, and the relationship between the two. We do know this relationship is not new, but it is going through a transformation over the last 10 to 15 years. And in more recent times, we have seen a significant amount of action on both sides of the administration, the government, industry, and civil society engage themselves much more with each other. You know, Alan Mulally used to say, the, the former Boeing CEO, that I've been through economic cycles and I've also been through geopolitical cycles. Considering what's going on in Ukraine right now, I think all of us, all of us need to be conscious that there is currently a geopolitical cycle that is in churn at this moment. So for us as two nations, the oldest democracy and the largest democracy in the world uh, with many shared and common interests, what is it that we need to do to ensure that our common interests are well served by any and every policy and action that we take right now? Because for India specifically, it is a little bit of a tightrope walk, considering our old relationship with the USSR and then with Russia, uh, it is certainly something that we need to do a hard think about. It is clear that over the last few years, our interest has been much more aligned towards the United States than many any other uh, grouping of uh, nations. So it brings forth a uh, whole variety of questions that I'm sure our expert panel are more than well equipped to answer. Let me start with you, uh, Mr. Suresh Prabhu. You have been uh, a politician, you have been a thinker, you have been a negotiator, you have, you have uh, played a key role in India's global trade. Um, and we are seeing that there is clearly a, a move towards distinct and separate trade, investment and technology camps developing across the globe. How do you think India should engage right now with the US without closing other options? Because we want to be connected multilaterally with a special relationship with US. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Munjal. Thank you, Rekha. Thank you, my co-panelists. I think this is, uh, as always, IMA has taken this very important step in shaping the direction in which we all should be moving for a mutuality uh, of goodness of each one of us. So that's really, I really congratulate you and also hope that this discussion will lead to something productive in terms of action, which will really benefit not just two countries, but the rest of the world. You know, this is a very important relationship with India and US. In fact, even during the Cold War time, the first agriculture revolution, the green revolution of India started because of US. The Secretary Freeman and Minister Subramanian actually made it happen. And in fact, had there not been an agriculture revolution, that green revolution, you can imagine what would happen. Of course, Mr. Mukundan would not be able to sell as many agrochemicals uh, besides many other benefits that accrued to us. So from the time we used to import food from US, the revolution helped India to be not just self-sufficient, but we are now exporting all kinds of agriculture products in different parts of the world. So I think this could be the lesson for how the relationship in future should work. India is a different country than what it was in 1966. It is going to be three trillion dollar economy, of course, much smaller than what US is, but a country with a lot of potential and a lot of opportunities for other countries to engage with. Because I always maintain with my friend with US that if you invest in, in India, you not have anything to worry about at later, later times. Because our economic growth is not going to pose any geostrategic challenge to the United States. Unlike some other countries where US invested billions of dollars and now they have to spend even more billions of dollars to combat that power. 
So that's not going to happen with India. So that's the greatest advantage of engaging with India. And as my dear friend Mr. Mujal pointed out, we have shared values. So we both believe in democracy. We both believe in human rights. We always believe that civil society should rise and the country should not just benefit in terms of economic growth, but also the values also should be assured us into a different kind of society. So that's another advantage of this relationship. And today, the technology which is going to drive the future growth of the world, either civilian technologies or military technologies, all kinds of technologies are going to really drive the situation. So I think US and India should work together. But I really completely agree with you as you, what you said earlier, that geopolitics will drive the future relationship. So, so let me so, take this to Harry now. Uh, I will come back to you a little bit later. So Harry, I want to, to take the same question to you with an add-on. How do we resolve? Because there are some thorny issues still in there in the discussion and the negotiation as we get towards an FTA a kind of an agreement or whatever you want to call it, because there are different kinds of agreements India is doing. Incidentally, you may, you may be aware that only two days ago, India signed uh, uh, an agreement with the UAE, which was negotiated in 88 days flat from start to finish, which must be some kind of a world record. Certainly it's a record for India. So uh, how do you think we should resolve the thorny issues that still exist in addition to the question I posed was Suresh. See, actually... Oh, I, I, can I get uh, Harry to bring... I'll, I'll bring you in a little bit later. Okay, if you don't mind. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay. I want an outside-in perspective now because okay, okay. we have an insider uh, view from sure. Mr. Suresh Prabhu. Harry's view would be from the US side and from outside of India would be helpful. Good. Thank you very much. I, I, I think you know we are at a moment, uh, both India and the US, because we are two large democracies, Sort of the, the world is, is our oyster here. Uh, given the relationship in trade and in other venues with China, and obviously with Russia, the two large democracies, I think, particularly in the economic side of the equation, can make some tremendous progress if there's a will. I think speaking from the, from the US side, I must say that I'm disappointed that our trade policy seems to be nothing new, seems to be regurgitating the previous administrations, the Trump administration's trade policy, and there have been really no significant initiatives at all. I'm actually quite surprised as a former trade negotiator. I mean, all, all that they have done is work on some steel duties, which is obviously important for India, but they've done that now with the EU and Japan. I think the question of a free trade agreement between the US and India would be a terrific step forward. And I would urge India to sort of take the bull by the horns and make a proposal. Uh, because I think given the, the latency of the US administration, I think if someone takes the initiative, like in India, I think you might get a positive reaction. It's not gonna be an easy negotiation to be sure, but I think this is an important opportunity and on the investment side, as we all know, I think, the bilateral investment treaty that India has uh, reformed or updated in 2016 is also another opportunity. This refers to what they just negotiated, I think, with the UAE, this uh, bilateral investment treaty. This would be another opportunity, I think, to take that forward with the United States. It's also, of course, important both in the U.S. economy domestically and the Indian economy domestically to put in place reforms that make us be able to trade uh, more freely and, and uh, less expensively with each other. And in the case of India, for instance, we know that some of the ports are not terribly efficient because they're not very deep. And so there's a lot of trade that has to come through transshipment you know, through Sri Lanka and other areas that makes trade more expensive, both exports from the U.S. to come into India and exports out of India to the U.S. So, you know, there's, there's work to be done domestically in the domestic economy agenda in India. And similarly in the U.S., uh, you know, we do not do a, a very good job in dealing with displaced workers on the trade side. So there's a, there's a big agenda there as well. But I think given that India will share the G20 at the end of this year, this is a really important opportunity for Mr. Modi to take the bull by the horns and make some very important initiatives. Right. So uh, Mukundan, let me expand this further 
you know, US India recently signed something on the farm trade with pomegranates and pork, for example. Now, do you believe that is enough? Do you believe we can do more uh, and allow a much more open import of US agri goods uh, uh, to India? Since you deal with chemicals, you are, in a sense, also. Uh, stepping on some of these areas as well. And of course, you have uh, great exposure to, to business and economy. Yeah. Thank you, Sunil. I think uh, absolutely important point. I, I'm delighted that Suresh, um, Suresh Prabhu started with agriculture because I think that can be the starting point. But I think the relationship is much wider and richer. If you really look at it, we are living in a world which is going to be moving towards digitalization. So there are huge opportunities in digital economy which can harness Indian talent and the world as the marketplace. I think that's one big area. Agriculture certainly is an area. And in fact, India has very competitive agriculture production in many of the inputs provided we give access to agri-processing to the investors from US into India. So it must be something we must harness. And uh, the uh, other element is uh, certainly we have a shared agenda, in my view, is uh, very close to chemical sector, which is the energy security. I think energy security is something we both need to build upon. So in, in my view, there are multiple layers of relationship which we both need to work on, especially in the new emerging world where I think we are all looking in post-COVID uh, element of uh, resilience as one key factor going forward, which means China plus one strategy is one of the key elements. You touched upon this tension which is there currently in Ukraine. I don't want to comment on that because it's a very delicate balance for India. And I think there is also another one which is on the anvil which you did not touch upon, which is the Iran uh, nuclear deal. If that were to happen, I think it also opens up India towards its own energy security issues. But more importantly, I think the point which you mentioned, which is the you, the, uh, the free trade agreement with UAE and the investment agreement which we have in place, we have to think a bit more imaginatively. I think our proximity to Middle East and our ability to convert many of these into chemicals, high value chemicals, and with the world as a market with technology coming from US can actually be a wonderful tripartite relationship which harnesses Indian talent, the US capital and the resources which are available in Middle East. So we have to think a little bit out of the box. But if you if you straight away say, are there opportunities? I think ours has been under, uh, let's say, underserved and under uh, uh, imagined in terms of the outcomes, the relationship between India and US. We need to do far more uh, in terms of investments, in terms of uh, trade, both inward and outward, both sides. And uh, we, we need to sort of drive it to a next level. And several of the elements which Harry mentioned in terms of, you know, uh, how do we make logistics much more efficient? I think the government's new initiative in Gati Shakti, how do you sort of uh, uh, make sure investors uh, have uh, the bridging risk capital available through PLI scheme? Many things which government has done, I think we need to sort of take it to the marketplace, make them, up, you know, make the, make the uh, various uh, stakeholders in the US aware of what steps India has taken to sort of attract them to Indian market. And obviously, we need to be sitting on the same side towards more open economy. Obviously, I think this uh, whole Atmanirbar, I, I think many times has been misinterpreted. It is not about protectionism, but it is about making sure that we give a breathing space and a kind of a time for Indian uh, industry to stand up and have a level playing field. It should be seen more in that way and rather than as a protectionism. Also, right. I think both sides need to make that effort to uh, uh, be open with each other, be sensitive to each other's uh, 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 points, which uh, may be in the short term, uh, sort of uh, coming in the way of us exploiting the long term to the fullest potential. But really speaking, multiple opportunities, not just in agriculture, in chemicals, all across all, every field. Defense, again, another area which I think is a huge opportunity for us. Yeah, so I couldn't agree with you uh, more, Mukundan, on the potential, the enormous potential that lies here uh, for both sides to benefit from. And, and I think uh, for too long, we've spoken of this relationship, or the potential of the relationship from a 30,000 feet high level. I think we need to get down to the nitty gritty of the minor micro details and try and resolve them one at a time while taking the quick wins that are that come our way. And I think that's the point Harry was trying to make earlier. I want to just take us in a slightly different direction since the theme uh, of this is about the post uh, pandemic relationship, the post virus relationship, the post COVID uh, relationship as 
as it's uh, been, been marked for us. I think we do need to appreciate for a minute the amount of work, the amount of effort, and the absolute tremendous human spirit that was demonstrated during this outbreak when we saw the worst and the best of humanity. We saw people getting impacted across, across the globe, across the board. It didn't matter how, how wealthy, prosperous, or smart or clever you were. Uh, everyone got affected. But the impact was, was different at different places. The, the poorer nations suffered more. Uh, India played a big role. US played a big role. Uh, both independently and together did some, some really tremendous work in turning out uh, new vaccines, getting them across to many parts of the world. I think this is something we all need to stand up and, and recognize and salute. Fantastic. So what does this mean now uh, going forward? Will uh, the healthcare, will pharma be much more in, in focus? Or at the same time, uh, the new initiatives like the Quad, which have been launched recently, would that be the, the big direction for growth uh, going forward? Mr. Suresh Prabhu, what is, what is your view on this? Uh, Mr. Prabhu? Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, uh, of course, uh, now we have, I was going to say that uh, the geopolitics which you mentioned earlier, so like pandemic, post-pandemic world, I think we we'll have to also think about post-Ukraine world. That's going to be a completely different world in which there are new geopolitical combinations taking place. Uh, the China and Russia are trying to take a similar position. The NATO, which of course, uh, not entire NATO, but particularly EU and uh, US and Canada are thinking about the world from a different angle. So we have to now chart out a different strategy as to how to deal with this world that is emerging. So it's not yet emerged. And therefore, this is going to be a very, very interesting and very calibrated moves we'll have to take to realize the potential, as you mentioned. I always maintain, I used to talk to USTR uh, many, many times, and in fact, we did a lot of efforts. And I always tell the USTR this important aspect that today your concern about India-US trade relationship is only one, that India is a trade surplus. I said that will disappear in no time, because if you start importing planes, there's one of the US company, Boeing, had said India needs 2,300 aeroplanes. And I also was aviation minister at that time, and therefore I had both. So I was trying to explain to him, this can change immediately. Again, oil now, which is touching 100 and probably, I don't know, I, I hope not, that it doesn't touch even new high ever achieved the oil price in the world. Now, oil and gas, we are also importing, but not gas, but oil we are importing from US. Because US is a net exporter of oil and gas, thanks to the shale gas and shale oil. So that's another opportunity. So we'll be doing that. So I was saying that we must focus on the big picture. Work on nitty gritties. Find out a solution. We actually worked on it. In fact, I remember having addressed all the issues that US was raising, including we had some challenges, as you know, in agriculture when we import, or dairy products when we import. The kind of thing. So what I did was, I talked to the Dairy Producers Association of the United States. I talked to the farmers of the United States, and they themselves were trying to communicate to the U.S. administration that what India is saying makes sense. So I think we really need to work on those issues. I feel if you look at the potential, and if you look at the advantage of dealing with India, India can actually provide, in a way, a geopolitical space, geoeconomic space for US in a way that no other country can provide. And therefore, I think this is something which we should try to harness in the post-COVID, but as I said, also in the post-Ukraine world. I think right. this is something good, which we have to work on the yeah, Absolutely. So uh, let me take one step forward from this, Harry. This is an interesting direction I think the conversation is going in. Uh, let's talk a little bit about technology. We know that technology is one of the big drivers of change in the world and in many ways also creating some of the new mega trends in the world. India and Indians have had a key role to play. While US has been the big technological leader, a lot of that has been run by Indians uh, as individuals or also by Indian companies. Do you think there is uh, an important role here for US and India to play together 
to allow, since we've spoke about China earlier, uh, Mukundan mentioned this, to uh, allow uh, US more freedom from the dependence on, on China's uh, goods and for India on the, uh, the technology side, because we don't even manufacture our own uh, uh, microchips or, or, or uh, uh, silicon wafers right now. So is there a win-win available for both sides to pitch in and make an effort together to look at both hardware, software, and the new technologies going forward? Sunil, you must have read my mind because this is exactly the point that I wanted to come back to, which is collaboration on research and development between the United States and India. Uh, we're, we're both you know, quite beholden, unfortunately, to China uh, but I think the, the world, the democracies again, the open democracies should begin to address more forcefully how to collaborate on research and development and not so much the basic science, but the applied R&D, the technologies. And one of the uh, issues that I've been working with behind the scenes in the G7 this year has been, you know, how can we put together a new regime of international agreements in science and technology. I used to be the lead negotiator for the US on science and technology agreements. And I think doing something like that with India would resonate extremely well, both from the human capital side and from the industrial strength side. And I, again, I say with Mr. Modi taking the lead in the G20, this is another issue I think putting on the, on the front burner how can we collaborate bilaterally, the US India on, on applied R and D? And you know, we can pick a couple of sectors as test beds, but I think it's a no brainer that I think this is an extraordinarily shared uh, asset that the US and India really should collaborate on. Right, thank you. That, I, I, that's an important area, I, I would completely uh, agree. Uh, so let me also take up some of the uh, uh, questions and comments that are coming in from the participants now. Uh, again, pushing forward on the same idea of research, Mukundan. Uh, one of the big commitments the world is making on sustainability is net zero. US and India have both announced their big numbers, the dates. Mr. Modi made a big announcement, as you know, at COP26, which was much appreciated. Uh, and then we got some flag for uh, for some of the issues around uh, usage of coal, etc. Uh, but it is it is clear that this uh, transformation is going to need both technology and is going to need large funding together. So, do you have a point of view on how we can uh, accelerate the process of getting to net zero from the current committed dates that are out there? I absolutely think we are wired somehow because this is the point I wanted to bring up with the same point which you raised just now. So I'm just reading people's minds. That's all I'm doing, by the way. <laughs> Terrific. I think it's fantastic. But this is also from the, from the audience. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I think one of the big areas of cooperation should be this whole shift to sustainability. And I think, uh, let, let me list a few. I think this transition pathway India will need towards green economy when it builds a huge amount of solar, builds a huge amount of wind energy, cannot be without transitioning what is going to give us the base load. Very simply, the base load has to move out of coal. And I think US is one of the uh, countries which has done the tremendous highest amount of work in terms of SMR technology. I think the nuclear SMR technology is something India and US must sign and push hard. And I think that it, 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 there, there will be some liability issues on both sides. I think that is something government should overcome. Uh, if you look at the new scale investment and the GE's investment, which has happened in SMR, which is bringing the nuclear into more modular 100, 200, 300 megawatt power plant, I think it's, it, it is going to be one of the key components of the green energy transition. The second one, which has already been articulated as part of the quad, is this green mobility piece, which is around how do we have a cooperation between India, Australia, and US in building a tight uh, sort of relationship to build the lithium ion and the uh, energy storage uh, process. And lastly is on green hydrogen. Again, I think a lot of work in terms of artificial photosynthesis. I must tell you that uh, our group was one of the ones which funded MIT in artificial photosynthesis for green hydrogen 
but it was 15 years ahead of its time. So obviously uh, we haven't been able to commercialize it, but I think now the time has come to revisit those initial steps which we had taken. But really one of the best uh, areas of cooperation, I think will be to build a common interest in energy security. But I want to add a bit more on this, uh, Sunil, if you don't mind. Fundamentally, uh, there are areas which India and uh, US can cooperate for each other's benefit. We speak a lot about oil imports into India, but actually our biggest import bill is going to be electronics very soon. Yes. So building local electronic industry has been something which we've been highlighting to government as part of IMA, as part of various associations which we jointly represent, that it is a must investment we must do. And here I think cooperation between US and India is something which can help us leapfrog. A uh, really delighted government has come out with a PLI scheme and some of the large groups are taking the steps in building electronic footprint in India right now, but it's on one area. And the third area, which I think is an area which was spoken, whose potential I think can transform agriculture, can transform many of the sectors we are speaking is biotechnology. Again, US is a leader in biotechnology and I think cooperation there. So several areas, energy, electronics, biotechnology, I think huge potential as world moves towards sustainability in, in the long run. So, Mr. Suresh Prabhu, uh, given that both US and India have many complementary interests, but also there are clearly some competing interests. Uh, if you take, for example, the um, uh, security and, and also the economic interests. So you, at the margins, you are kind of stepping on each other's toes. And this is the question I was trying to ask earlier. How, when you are building up a big relationship, how do you ensure the minor irritants do not take up uh, most of the room for the conversation? Since you've been a, a successful negotiator, I thought this would be an appropriate question for you. You know, actually, if you look at it, I'll just, one minute, I'll just touch on this earlier question you posed to my other fellow panelists from sustainability. Sure, sure. One is the technology, cooperation, can benefit both the countries for sure. The question of IPR will always be there. And therefore, when you discuss technologies between two commercial organizations, obviously there will be IPRs and they can share it very easily through the agreement that they can sign a shareholder agreement and many other things. I'm talking about sustainability. If you are talking about sustainability, either it can be achieved through corporate agreement or it can be taken to a new level because we don't have much time left for the planet to wait and say that we can achieve something in another 50 years, 100 years, it's not going to work. So that the time is not there. It's like a surgery to be performed. And you say, I'll wait for somebody like in the US. There's a heart transplant had to be done and they're not finding a donor or a person. So they picked the pig and picked up a heart of a pig and did a surgery. So I think in climate change and sustainability issue, if you can work on some of the bigger issues like what Shamkudan mentioned about storage, energy storage or new energy, I think that cooperation can be done, not just with two countries can take lead, US and India. We should take all other countries on board, make those technologies for global good. I think that can save all of us because otherwise the time will go. If you work on IPRs, so non-IPR technologies can be developed. So that's my short point. Now coming to this very important issue of uh, how to remove the small irritants. I think this all depends upon where are you looking at. Your eyes are where are the eyes? Eyes are on the immediate presence or something that can be achieved in a medium term by working on cooperation. If we just change the vision from immediate challenges to something with a huge potential, automatically these small returns will disappear. But if you still focus on that all the time, that's what I used to convey to my counterpart in the US, that you know we are just missing out an opportunity only because we are focusing on something which is really, really, in my opinion, and that's what I, as I told you, the stakeholders in the US also are convinced about it. So therefore, I think we should have to work on these issues. And I think this is definitely possible. I had a great regard for my counterpart, uh, the USTR. And I think now with the new administration in place, it's no longer new, more than a year now. But I think we should try to refocus on this relationship and trade. As to be because in the US India, the US um, organization, the US uh, Chamber of Commerce, which is in fact a very big organization, the CEO of US Chamber of Commerce can always tell you the potential in this relationship, not between two governments, not between two negotiators, not between two uh, Commerce Department of India and Com Commerce Department of United States, 
but they realize this potential and i think if we can just be guided by them guided by the business because trade is business finally so if the business feels this has to be done i think we all government should agree with this so let's take this on you're right the uh, the government can set out policy uh, the direction be a facilitator but then must take a step back when it comes to the actual action and that must remain uh, the investments the the uh, trade the business the services the goods the manufacturing must obviously remain with uh, enterprise and companies so harry how do you think india can be the most attractive opportunity um uh, as people look at an alternate to china or an addition to china as especially as compared to other southeast asian and south asian nations like indonesia vietnam thailand etc etc because they're also trying to build their economies and their base both of manufacturing and services india uh, has many unique strengths what do you believe are the two or three things india could and should do uh, to be the most attractive of those we have a natural advantage in terms of size of market etc i'm i'm talking other than that now yeah i mean I, I, and i and i think you know the the earlier point that you raised about how do you keep your eye on the big picture mm-hmm. but w- at least when i was negotiating um you know let's say let's talk about growth growth yeah. of flows of trade growth of flows of investment and that way you you frame the picture in a much more macro sense now obviously the little irritants are going to going to creep forward but i think you know you know as as we've been discussing we got two very large democracies India and the United States what could India do i mentioned this a little bit earlier the infrastructure within india in, with respect to external trade i think really is a need of reform uh, and investment and i mentioned you know for instance the ports you know on the on the on the eastern seaboard you know india is blessed you know straddling two huge oceans and is a, is a is a is a mega pathway for ocean shipment Uh, but the problem is that the port sector again mostly on the eastern side of of india is extraordinarily inefficient and so you've got ships that are very large that can't come to the ports directly they've got to offload in in a, in a third port maybe sri lanka and then come back to india on smaller boats and the problem is is that to be frank the ports in india are not deep enough to accommodate these larger vessels and and you know in every country you know ports are are magnets for protectionism uh and you know the, the local economy we understand that and chambers of commerce understand that but i think opening up the infrastructure reforming the infrastructure and making investments in the indian infrastructure with respect to trade with respect to external flows i think could do an incredible amount of of win-win investment and trade flows between the united states and india and of course other places in the world which i think will boost india's growth in the world economy right absolutely so uh, all in all from what i'm hearing uh, from all of you and and of course i i quite concur with the view that this is a an absolutely amazing time for us to build on this old relationship focused on the future keeping an eye on the things that are irritants to make sure they don't become the big hurdles but at the same time moving this forward let me bring up the the area and field of startups uh, uh, mukund and i spoke about technology but startups is a whole different animal it's transforming the way business is done the way businesses grow the opportunities available uh, for job creation the amazing innovation taking place across the globe for goods and services also for public services so what is your view on how uh, the us and india can in a sense be co-creators uh, uh, clearly us has had more uh, growth and, and more time than most others because they started this before we did but uh, clearly uh, india is doing a pretty amazing job we are the third largest uh, Uh, ecosystem today for startups and also amongst the most successful uh, at this moment so what are the, the the things you think which are critical at this moment for for us to support both ends of the growth i think uh, one of the key things is if, and and you you raised this in a point which you said you don't want to go there but i think we have to go there if you have to address this question 
I think if if the world needs us to move, and if you have to sort of um, make it move in a substantial way, the needle has to move in India. And I think finding solutions for large number of people at a value and a cost which they can afford and affordability is is one big issue. I think I think it sort of opens up a market which is uh, sort of unthinkable in terms of the numbers itself, sheer numbers. And we've seen that in India, once it is done, these solutions then are probably one of the most cost effective. If you look at fintech in India. the kind of solutions and access which indian fintech has done i think it's a it's a solution waiting to be taken to us so i'm just saying about how do we take the solutions from here to us it certainly can trans, trans, transfer and transport there at the same time i think there are many many startups which need the you know what what has been done in the us to be brought to india when you talk about various platform technologies which start startups are doing especially in terms of uh, the access to uh, let's say shared mobility access to uh, shared uh, stays all these uh, solutions have been done in us and we are trying to bring them into india in terms of making it more cost efficient so clearly i think one is the I- the world of ideas itself for it to take shape it needs a large market of course the market is very competitive in india but i think that india does give second is a market which you can exp- uh, sort of explore at the edges which is willing to pay a premium that market exists in us but more importantly what we also need to really uh, appreciate is the access to capital is something which us does provide so i think for both indian startups as well as uh, taking these ideas to marketplace if you look at the the valuations which many of the startups are getting and that that is fundamentally driven off the appreciation of what these startups can deliver in terms of new models and that appreciation comes from the capital which has been sitting in us which has already seen this being delivered it's not just in startup space in terms of uh, technology digital it is also in the startup space in terms of let's say the new energy which we spoke about the ev revolution so what 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 you it, the list the recent listing of the uh, let's say the renewable energy company in us market the recent uh, uh, you know uh, financing of uh, uh, by the by the capital markets to uh, ev vehicle company in india i think they're all pointers to a, uh, a point that uh, i i, I think uh, the capital markets have realized the potential i think uh, businesses need to sort of uh, work with their individual governments exactly what mr prabhu said to make sure these small irritants are taken out of the way and every piece we are able to sort of position this in terms of a long medium and long term vision and not get stuck with the short term irritants which you also highlighted so this is this is uh, brilliant i have to say this has been a wonderful conversation very comprehensive i want to top it off by just mentioning a couple of other things which because of a time constraint we could not bring up in our conversation are the people to people exchange education culture music healthcare it is just such a tremendous opportunity and incidentally there is appreciation on both sides uh, i was talking to a friend of mine the other day who is a very senior uh, healthcare professional in the us and we said he said we have an association of senior doctors across north america and the single largest ethnic community is indians in there and by the way it's it's not very different if you look at education the top institutions uh, in the us uh, either uh, technology or liberal arts uh, it's it's it, it's interesting that this connect already exists there are families on both sides uh connected to each other there are many friends uh, connected to each other and i think we need to build on this human angle and perspective because that's what we saw during the covid era that people showing concern for people strangers that they, they had no clue who they were but they went out to support them help them uh whether they were charitable institutions or they were individuals or they were for profit uh, all of them actually got supported without any questions being asked and i think that is the true uh, essence and spirit of this relationship that when push comes to shove you will support each other in good times it's always easier you know when things are going well uh, you don't even notice the weaknesses you don't see the kinks and i think it's it's wonderful uh, that we both both realized appreciated and moved towards supporting and helping each other uh, build a better world uh during this very difficult and very challenging time i hope we don't forget these lessons but we build on top of that with specifics on 
trade, on business, on oil, on technology, on systems, on process, on software. And I think this is, this is what creates an absolutely amazing set of opportunities. So I would think it is less about problems. It is much more about opportunities. So it really and literally depends on all of us as people, as corporates, as governments, as institutions and organizations to build something special of this relationship, which has been around for a while, but really can do with much more fertilization, much more energy, much more support to build a relationship which uniquely benefits the people in the US and the people in India. Thank you very much uh, to uh, my three very eminent speakers. Thank you, Rekha, for inviting us to, to this very unique session for All India Management session at uh, Horasis US. Thank you.